Hi, this is Arctic de la Pena, and in this short lecture, I'm going to talk about the pathophysiology of ADHD. Take note that the pharmacology of ADHD drugs will be discussed separately in class. At the end of this presentation, you should be able to define ADHD and state the three core symptoms of the disorder, state the genetic and environmental risk factors of ADHD, identify the brain areas that are affected in individuals with ADHD, recall the neurotransmitter systems assumed to be involved in ADHD, and finally, predict the mechanism of action of ADHD treatments based on the knowledge you gained about the pathophysiology of the disorder. Now, what is Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD? ADHD is an ongoing pattern of inattention and or hyperactivity impulsivity that interferes with functioning or development. That's the DSM-5 definition of ADHD, and the DSM-5 criteria for ADHD will be discussed by your clinical professor. Based on the definition, you can already tell that the core symptoms of ADHD are inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. Furthermore, three subtypes or presentations of ADHD are recognized in the DSM-5, namely 1. Predominantly inattentive, that is, when an individual shows mostly inattentive symptoms. 2. Predominantly hyperactive impulsive, when an individual shows mostly hyperactive slash impulsive symptoms. And 3. Combined presentation, when an individual shows both inattentive and hyperactivity slash impulsive symptoms. Like all complex medical and psychiatric disorders, ADHD shows significant diversity at clinical, ideological, and pathophysiological levels. Individuals with ADHD differ from each other in terms of their core symptom combinations, level of impairment and comorbidities, as well as on genetic and environmental contributing factors. With regard to epidemiology, the rates of ADHD vary across multiple studies. A meta-analysis of 86 studies in children and adolescents with ADHD reported that worldwide, the prevalence rate was about 7.2% of youths under 18 years old. In the United States, about 5% of children suffer from this disorder. It is important to note that ADHD is not just a childhood disorder. It is also present in adults. In fact, ADHD in childhood and adolescents persists into adulthood in 50 to 66 percent of individuals. Furthermore, ADHD also shares significant comorbidity with a number of disorders such as autism spectrum disorder and Tourette syndromes, learning disabilities, mood disorders, for example bipolar disorders, behavioral problems such as oppositional defined disorders and conduct disorders, and also substance use disorder or SUD. Now let's switch gears and talk about the pathophysiology of ADHD. Decades of research have shown that genes play a vital role in the etiology of ADHD and its comorbidity with other disorders. Moreover, Prenatal and postnatal cases such as maternal smoking and alcohol use and low birth weight in infants also increase ADHD risk. Now, what we've known so far are merely the specific genetic and environmental contributors of ADHD. But how they interact to produce the ADHD behaviors remain to be clarified. We can assume, however, that the interaction between genetic and environmental factors could eventually affect the way genes encode proteins, affect structure and functions of brain circuits, and eventually produce the behavioral and neurocognitive dysfunctions that are present in this disorder. Now let's talk about the genetics of ADHD. ADHD is a highly heritable disorder. In fact, the heritability of ADHD has been estimated to be about 76%, which is closely similar to that of schizophrenia. Through genome-wide association studies, genes associated with ADHD have been identified, such as those that are involved in monoaminergic systems, for example, dopamine receptor 4, 
dopamine receptor 1b, dopamine transporter, norepinephrine transporter, alpha 2a adrenergic receptors, serotonin transporter, serotonin receptor 1b, and others. In addition, genes encoding the alpha 7 acetylcholine receptor subunit, glutamate receptor genes, neuropeptide Y, and others have also been associated with ADHD. Now, let's talk about the environmental risk factors of ADHD. As I mentioned earlier, prenatal and perinatal factors such as maternal smoking and drinking and low birth weight in infants contribute to the pathophysiology of ADHD. Additionally, exposure to abnormal levels of stress, use of illicit substances, and viral infections during pregnancy, and infant exposure to toxic levels of lead, pesticides, PCBs, and other chemicals have also been known to contribute to the development of ADHD in those affected. Whether or not nutritional deficiencies, such as deficiencies in zinc and PUFAs, increase ADHD risk remains controversial. The contribution of psychosocial factors, such as low family income and harsh parenting, is also not yet fully established. However, very severe early social deprivation has been shown to increase risk of developing ADHD symptoms in children. As I said earlier, the interactions between genes and environment and the succeeding effect of these interactions in brain structure and functions likely play a role in the pathophysiology of ADHD. However, it is possible that environmental factors could result in epigenetic changes which in turn alter gene function and eventually neurodevelopment. From genes and environmental factors, let's talk about the brain areas that are assumed to be affected in ADHD. Indeed, a number of brain areas have been implicated in this disorder. fMRI studies in patients with ADHD have shown brain areas which are smaller, underactive, or underdeveloped in ADHD individuals. For instance, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex which is involved in working memory, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which is involved in complex decision-making and strategic planning, and the parietal cortex, which is linked to inattention, are reported to be underactive in ADHD. ADHD also affects the subcortical structures, for instance, the ventral anterior cingulate cortex and dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, which influence the affective and cognitive components of executive control. These structures, along with the basal ganglia, have been found to be smaller or underactive in ADHD individuals. Brain imaging studies have also showed structural and functional abnormalities in the amygdala and cerebellum of ADHD patients. Furthermore, ADHD affects the functions of neural networks that control complex processes. For example, ADHD has been shown to affect the executive control network, which along with the cortico-cerebellar networks coordinate executive functioning, such as planning, goal-directed behavior, inhibition, working memory, and others. In ADHD, these networks are underactivated and have lower functional connectivity. Moreover, the reward network, which includes the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, orbitofrontal cortex, and ventral striatum, is also affected in ADHD. The alerting network, which includes the frontal and parietal cortical areas and the thalamus, which interact in a complicated manner to support intentional functions, are weak in individuals with ADHD. Finally, ADHD affects the default mode network, which consists of the medial prefrontal cortex, posterior cingulate cortex, lateral parietal cortex, and medial temporal lobe. Lastly, let's talk about the neurotransmitter systems involved in the pathophysiology of ADHD.
Findings in preclinical studies have suggested the involvement of dopaminergic and noradrenergic neurotransmission in the pathophysiology of ADHD. If you remember, the dopaminergic system plays important roles in planning and initiation of motor responses, reaction to novelty, and processing of reward. Furthermore, dopamine has multiple actions in the prefrontal cortex to promote cognitive control of behavior. On the other hand, the noradrenergic system influences arousal, signal-to-noise ratios in cortical areas, cognitive processes, and cognitive presentation of urgent stimuli. Noradrenergic projections from the locus cerebellus also interact with dopaminergic projections from the ventral tegmental area to regulate cognitive control. Now, based on the proposed involvement of dopamine and norepinephrine in the pathophysiology of ADHD, what do you think are effective treatments for this disorder? If you answered drugs that influence the activity or the levels of these neurotransmitters, you are correct. In fact, the mechanism of action of metafinidate, atomoxetin, and amphetamine while they use ADHD medications, revolves around affecting the levels of dopamine and norepinephrine. However, there are also other ADHD drugs, which will be discussed in class, whose mechanism of action does not involve influencing the levels of these neurotransmitters. In summary, ADHD is a very common neurodevelopment disorder of childhood, of which symptoms and impairments may persist beyond childhood and into adulthood. Risk factors of ADHD include genetic and environmental factors, which interact to affect several molecular, neural, and neurocognitive pathways and cause abnormalities in the structure and function of the brain. It has been proposed that a functional impairment of ADHD is associated with abnormalities in the brain's neurotransmitter systems, in particular dopamine and norepinephrine, which are largely the targets of ADHD medications. Now that you've already learned about the pathophysiology of ADHD, try to ask yourself these questions. 1. What are the core symptoms of ADHD? Two, what has been known about the genetics of ADHD? 3. Which environmental factors have been shown to increase ADHD risk? 4. What neurotransmitters play a role in ADHD? And finally, in two to three sentences, how would you explain the pathophysiology of ADHD? Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in class.